From the greenhouse again, it's the Adam Ragusea podcast, episode 74. And this is the story of a beloved American fast food chain that now only exists as an echo of its former self in East Asia and proximate developing markets. Oh, did you think that I was talking about Kenny Rogers Roasters? Well, I am, but first I'm going to talk about Mr. Donut. Kenny Rogers and Mr. Donut are two U.S. fast food chains that have lived oddly parallel lives, and their stories say something important about U.S. versus global economies and tastes. Kenny Rogers and Mr. Donut also happen to have converged at a particular node in our spatial dimension, and that node could be found in the town where I grew up, hence my particular interest. Oh, you've never heard of Mr. Donut? Well, how about Dunkin' Donuts? You've heard of them, right? Right? Yeah, right. Started by a guy named William Rosenberg from Dorchester, Mass., Cradle of the Wahlbergs. The post-World War II building boom in the U.S. created armies, armies of hungry construction workers who needed quick, concentrated calorie bombs to get through their days. And Bill Rosenberg was there with his little company, Industrial Luncheon Services. He'd made some money selling war bonds, he used it to convert old taxi cabs and telephone trucks into primitive food trucks, and he'd roll up on the job site or in the parking lot of the factory or whatever right when the lunch whistle blew, and not surprisingly, this was a very successful little business. But after a while, he noticed that 40% of his total sales were for coffee and donuts, Nothing else, just coffee and donuts. A fellow working outside around Boston is liable to get cold most months of the year, and he needs to warm up with a cup of hot joe. The coffee also contains caffeine, a psychoactive drug that gives the user the illusion of being more awake and alert than they actually are, and I'm sure the managers down at the job site felt real good about that. Plus... Manual labor is extremely calorie intensive, and few foods are more energy dense than a deep fried ball of sugar dough with frosting on top. So, yeah, coffee and donuts. Anyway, Bill Rosenberg opened his first donut shop in 1948 in Quincy, Mass., which is pronounced like a Z, Quincy, not Quincy. I don't know if that knowledge will be useful to you at some point in your life, but I figured I'd just get it out there. It's hard doing radio in Boston at first. <laughs> Bill Rosenberg's new donut place in Quincy was called Open Kettle. Open Kettle. Is there such a thing as a closed kettle? A kettle is a specialized device for boiling water, generally for hot beverage. It's a simple thing, short and stout. Here is its handle, here is its spout, through which the hot liquid flows. The spout generally does not have any kind of cap or lid on it. If the spout did have a cap, I would understand calling your restaurant open kettle because it implies that the kettle through which your delicious restoring coffee or tea shall flow is now open. All you need do, weary workman, is position your little cup under that spout to receive its bounty. But the spout generally doesn't have any kind of cap or lid, so that doesn't make any sense. There generally is a lid at the top of the kettle through which you pour your water to be heated. I assume the function of that lid is to retain heat in the form of steam, thus bringing the liquid to a boil faster when the lid is closed. But I doubt open kettle is referring to that lid, because how would that lid being open be a selling point? 
Come to Open Kettle in Quincy, where our water takes slightly longer to boil because we left the kettle open. Looking at the Oxford English Dictionary, it seems kettle used to refer more broadly to all kinds of vessels used for heating a liquid. So it's possible that kettle in 1948 referred to the pot in which the oil was boiled for frying the donuts. And such a kettle might indeed have had a lid, but I still don't understand how the lack of a lid there would have been a selling point. Open kettle seems like kind of a bad name. Maybe that's why Bill Rosenberg changed the name in 1950 to Dunkin' Donuts, spelled D-O-N-U-T. If you're calling your treat a donut, what you're saying is that it's like a nut, but made out of dough. It's an oily little lump, like a nut, but it's made of dough, so it's a dough nut. And in that context, you would probably spell it D-O-U-G-H-N-U-T. But according to Dunkin' Donuts internal company lore, Rosenberg struck the phonetically unnecessary silent letters from the name so that he could make the letters that he kept bigger on the gigantic sign that he designed. Hey, good thinking. I will say whilst I'm logged into my Oxford English Dictionary subscription, that there is a recorded instance of the word donut spelled without the silent U-G-H all the way back in 1782. But good ideas do tend to get reinvented over time and space, so let's give Bill Rosenberg the benefit of the doubt that he, for himself, invented the streamlined spelling of donut that has since penetrated popular usage. Anyway... Things went unsurprisingly well for the first Dunkin' Donuts location in Quincy, Mass. So well that in 1955, Rosenberg inked his first franchise deal, a business arrangement to allow a different corporate entity to make and sell Dunkin'-branded donuts. What a coup. There was only one problem. Bill Rosenberg had a business partner named Harry Winokur. Harry was Bill's brother-in-law. Bill Rosenberg's adult children, who now run his company, still refer to their dad's old business partner as Uncle Harry. I'm quoting now from an oral history of the Dunkin' Donuts Company published by Boston Magazine in 2010. Bob Rosenberg... Bill's son, who took over the business, Bob Rosenberg, said, quote, Uncle Harry Winokur was my father's partner. He and my dad did not get along. Why not? Well, here's the quote from David Slater, Harry Winokur's son-in-law. Quote, Winokur would say, we've got six stores, we got seven, that's enough. Bill would say, I want 70. After a while, that became a problem with them. End quote. Sounds like Uncle Harry was admirably conservative in his business instincts, but not Bill. Bill Rosenberg wanted it all. Bob Rosenberg. They finally broke up in 1955, and we bought Uncle Harry out for $350,000. He used that to start the Mr. Donut chain. David Slater, Uncle Harry's son-in-law. I became CEO of Mr. Donut. It was an absolute carbon copy of Dunkin' Donuts. The donut variety was 100% the same. But the Red Sox and Yankees don't compete any harder than our two chains did. You couldn't even dunk a donut at Mr. Donut. You dipped them. End quote. For the uninitiated, they're discussing the verb that their respective companies used to describe the act of wetting your donut in your coffee before taking a bite. By the way, I say this as a relatively new coffee drinker who doesn't eat a whole lot of donuts. Wow, I just recently realized how amazing coffee and donuts taste together. Because the coffee balances the sweetness of the donut. That combination is a hit for a reason. Try it yourself. 
in the comfort of your own home with much better coffee than you typically find at a donut place with Trade Coffee, sponsor of this episode. Get a free bag with any subscription purchase right now at drinktrade.com slash adamshow. Trade is a coffee discovery service. They constantly curate a collection of coffees from 55 plus top indie roasters. And based upon your tastes and your preferences for whole bean or pre-ground or calf or decaf or whatever, Trade chooses a new and exciting roast for you and sends it to your door, such as this one that I have right here that I love. Rather, actually, I should say it's the independent roaster that sends the coffee to your door within 48 hours of roasting, which makes a big difference. Your typical donut joint coffee is going to be stale. Anyway, Trade's matching algorithm curates a constant stream of new and interesting coffees just for you, however fast you go through it. Shipping is free. Cancel or change your plan anytime is honestly the best. I went from like zero to 60 on my coffee knowledge real fast because I had trade sending me all different things. And now I know what I like in a cup of coffee. I like light roasts, natural or honey process, but that's a niche taste. If you like the more common thing that people like, dark roasts, wet processed, they've got that for you too. And if you don't know what any of that means, well, just buy a trade subscription and read the little cards that they send with the coffee, telling you how it was made and why it tastes the way it does. You'll get up to speed real quick. Get that free bag with any subscription at drinktrade.com slash Adam show. That's drinktrade.com slash Adam show to make sure that the Ragusia pod gets credit. The pod could uh, definitely use your help. The videos are fine, but the pod could use the, uh, the trade bump. Drinktrade.com slash Adam show. Thank you, Trade Coffee. Anywho, Uncle Harry went off and started his competing Mr. Donut restaurant chain in Boston with... Mr. Spelled all the way out, you know, not abbreviated as is common. Mr. Spelled all the way out and donut spelled in the new, more sign friendly manner without the extra silent letters. Mr. Donut was so successful that they quickly got franchise offers themselves and perhaps a little competitive drive is all that Uncle Harry needed to get over his instinctive conservatism, and Mr. Donut spread rapidly up and down the American East Coast. Indeed, the first donut I remember eating in my childhood in central Pennsylvania was a Mr. Donut. My favorite donut as a child, the only donut I would eat, because kids are infuriating like that, the only donut I would eat was this chocolate cake donut from Mr. Donut, probably dipped in sugar glaze and then rolled in coarsely ground peanuts. I believe this was called the golden chocolate flavor, and I don't want to know what I would give up right now to taste a Mr. Donut chocolate and crushed peanut butter donut. I'm sure it wouldn't be as good as I remember it, because nothing could be. And now because of nut allergies, I doubt we will see a peanut encrusted donut in a case of a major chain ever again. Cross contamination. I have such happy memories of sitting in that parking lot on North Atherton Street in State College, PA, waiting for my mom or dad to step out with that paper bag of donuts. Because people used to just leave their small children alone inside cars while they were running errands. But the good times couldn't roll on forever. After decades of competing fiercely with Duncan, decades in which both chains spread all over the United States and then the world, Duncan finally won. Or at least that's what the Duncan Donuts people will tell you. That is their history that their internal corporate lore records. Indeed, Duncan was much more successful than Mr. Donut. Mr. Donut peaked at a few hundred stores in the U.S., while Duncan had thousands. But perhaps a more accurate way of looking at it is that both Duncan and Mr. Donut lost because they both got bought out, which I suppose is actually a win for the ownership class. I don't know what it is for the rest of us who have fewer donut options as a result, but in 1989... 
The Rosenbergs sold out to a giant British food and beverage conglomerate that was then called Allied Lions. And it was with that Allied Lions money behind them that they immediately turned around and bought out Mr. Donut. Actually, from what I can gather, Allied Lions bought Mr. Donut directly. And then eventually Mr. Donut came under Duncan Brands which itself was under Allied Lions. But the point is, all of a sudden, the Brits owned all the donuts, which I remember being like a minor scandal in the U.S., given what a quintessentially American product the donut is, setting aside the fact that donuts are German slash Dutch. I suppose the United States is heavily German. Germans remain the largest single ethnic group in the United States to the extent to which you could even call German Americans a distinct ethnic group anymore. Germans just kind of became white people and white people kind of became Germans, especially in the Midwest and in Pennsylvania, where the Mr. Donut location on North Atherton Street closed. I would guess somewhere around 1990. Because I remember being devastated when Mr. Donut closed, and that reaction seems consistent with me being around eight years old at the time. Still haven't had a donut as good as the golden chocolate or whatever the peanut-crusted chocolate donut was called. If it still existed, it'd still probably be the only donut I would eat. I remain firmly on Team Chocolate Cake Donut, The Brits bought Dunkin' Donuts and Mr. Donut, but Dunkin' was the more popular brand. So Mr. Donut franchises gradually converted into Dunkies or they went out of business. Allied Lions was itself acquired by the French alcohol giant Pernod Ricard. Allied itself was an alcohol brand, you know, Allied breweries of Burton-on-Trent. So then the French owned all the donuts, but in 2005, they sold Dunkin' Brands to a group of U.S.-based private equity firms, including Boston-based Bain Capital, and thus Dunkies returned to Boston from whence it came. Former Bain Capital CEO Mitt Romney was, at the time, governor of Massachusetts, which made it all the more amusing when, a few years later, Romney was the Republican nominee for president, struggling to relate to the working class base of his party, and he made a campaign stop at a restaurant where he pointed to some donuts, and he said, hey, can you see that one of those chocolate um, uh, chocolate goodies finds its way to our ride? Mitt Romney, former governor of Massachusetts, former CEO of Bain Capital, which owned Dunkin' Donuts and what remains of Mr. Donut. That guy, in the heat of the campaign, failed to successfully identify a donut. Can't believe he lost. And then a few years later, when the Republican Party moved in a decidedly non-Romney direction, a lot of us felt pretty nostalgic for that guy. Some of us might even consider voting for that guy right about now. But anyway, there is, as far as I can tell, one Mr. Donut location remaining in the entire United States in Godfrey, Illinois, just over the river from St. Louis. I must go there. If anyone has any personal connections to the Mr. Donut in Godfrey, out toward Lewis and Clark Community College, please do get in touch. But I might just fly there one day. Don't say I didn't warn you. Godfrey, Illinois is where the story of Mr. Donut ends. In the United States. Something totally different happened in Japan. Duncan and Mr. Donut both descended upon the Japanese market in the early 1970s. Japan had been decimated by its own aggressive global war of conquest just a quarter century earlier, 
American occupiers proceeded to remake Japan in their own image to be a bulwark against communism in Asia, and the resulting Japanese economic miracle made Japan the second largest economy in the world at the time. An isolated island chain filled to the brim with newly wealthy consumers, positively predisposed to American culture and American brands. It was time for some donut diplomacy in the 1970s. Duncan and Mr. Donut both went in, but for whatever reason, Mr. Donut was way more successful there. Mr. Donut lost the U.S. Donut Wars, but decisively won the Japanese Donut Wars to the point where Duncan gave up and pulled out of the country entirely in the late 1990s. So when Duncan Brands ultimately acquired Mr. Donut, they saw no reason to mess with success in Japan. Mr. Donut locations in Japan remained branded as Mr. Donut as they remain to this day. I got the style, but not the grace. I got the clothes, but not the face. I got the bread, but not the butter. I got the window, but not the shutter. But I'm big in Japan. I'm big in Japan. Hey, boy. I'm big in Japan. So wrote the great American singer-songwriter Tom Waits in the 90s, when it seemed as though Japan might actually dethrone the U.S. as the dominant global economic power. Then the Japanese stopped having babies, and now... Nobody worries about Japan anymore. Japan may be a nation on the decline, but East Asia as a whole is a region on the rise, and where Japanese soldiers failed to colonize, Mr. Donut succeeded from their base in Japan. Mr. Donut is today huge in Thailand, the Philippines, Taiwan, Indonesia, probably some places I'm leaving out. But of course, the most important question is, if I get on a plane to Manila right now, could I, in 48 hours, be eating the chocolate Mr. Donut with the crushed peanut crust? I found a 2014 blog post from somebody in the Philippines who wrote about going across the street to the 7-Eleven to get donuts. Mr. Donuts are sold in 7-Elevens. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr.'s Donut are sold in 7's 11 in the Philippines, these Philippine. Quote, The choco peanut just tasted bready and greasy. I wouldn't have that again. That's about the extent of the review. I found other dispatches from Asia talking about the golden chocolate flavor, but the pictures all seem to show something that's closer to like a streusel crust rather than a peanut crust. Is that what the golden chocolate flavor was all along? Am I making up that it had peanuts or am I making up that the peanut one was called golden chocolate? This is why eyewitness testimony is unreliable. My kingdom for a chocolate peanut donut from Mr. Donut. Mr. Donut on North Atherton in State College, Pennsylvania closed circa 1990. I was devastated, but then something funny happened. A different establishment moved into the former Mr. Donut location on Atherton. A new chicken joint started by the guy who sang The Gambler. If I'm honest, I got to tell you that my favorite roast chicken is not any of the many chickens I have roasted on the internet. Those are all good roast chickens. I'm sorry, I believe the plural is roasts chicken. All of my roasts chicken are good, but they're not my favorite roast chicken. You can't have my favorite roast chicken, and neither can I, because my favorite roast chicken doesn't exist anymore, at least not in my hemisphere. And the titular roaster of said chicken sang Islands in the Stream with Dolly Parton. 
I can't unlove you, Kenny Rogers Roasters. Kenny Rogers was born in Houston, Texas in 1938, and he is the third biggest selling country music artist of all time after Garth Brooks and George Strait. Fourth biggest selling if you still count Taylor Swift as country, but obviously nobody does. Point is, Kenny was extremely successful. He started off playing bass and singing in 50s folk acts, and his first big hit, I Did Not Know This, was a psychedelic rock song about LSD called Just Dropped In to See What Condition My Condition Was In. Listen to that with the lights off. But he steered his career in a more country direction, and in 1978, he cut a song by Don Schlitz that had been bouncing around Nashville for a couple of years and was recorded unsuccessfully by a few artists, including Johnny Cash. The song was called The Gambler, and it taught us that you gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, and know when to run. Ain't that the truth? I presume. I don't play cards or gamble, so I don't know what any of that means, but it sounds like good advice. Kenny really pioneered the whole silver fox look. Like he had this immaculately trimmed full beard, and he started to go prematurely gray in his 20s. As a result, he looked like an old man most of his life. His beard obscured his aging face, and his build did not change very much over the course of his life, so the result was that it felt like Kenny Rogers was eternal. He was always there, generation after generation. Trends come and go, but always there is Kenny, with his silver hair and shiny suits. And that particular way he held his microphone the vertical style it's been called by me i sent it in letter to the editor anyway i feel the same way about steve martin you know he's been gray almost his whole adult life and he's stayed in pretty good shape so he's looked exactly the same my entire life steve martin is also eternal I got to hurry up and go gray, man, because I got a few white ones on my chin. But man, that silver fox look that that works. Point is, we're talking about one of the biggest selling music artists of all time here. Back in the days when selling records actually made you money, a lot of money. So it's hard to know exactly what madness came over Kenny Rogers when he decided to invest some of that money into a restaurant chain. I suppose divorce is expensive, and he was married five times, as was the habit of people in that generation, the first generation to have easy access to divorce, and yet they were still socially conservative enough that they thought they had to get married, so... Marriage and divorce, marriage and divorce on an endless cycle. I suppose the central figure in the story of Kenny Rogers Roasters is not the gambler himself, but a guy named John Y. Brown Jr. The son of a Kentucky congressman, John Brown Jr. says he got his first money selling encyclopedias door to door in college. I imagine he actually got his first money by being born to John Brown Sr., congressman of Kentucky. But anyway, a Kentucky political breakfast in 1963 happened. John Brown Jr. was there, and he got to talking with the Kentucky colonel himself, Colonel Harlan Sanders, who had built his patented pressure fryer invention into a chain of more than 600 Kentucky fried chickens. Oh, I'm sorry. Kentucky's fried chicken. Fried chickens, Kentucky. Anyway, Colonel Sanders was already in his seventies by then. And John Y. Brown Jr. got the sense that he might be ready to sell. So Brown convinced the serial entrepreneur, Jack Massey, he of the contemptible hospital corporation of America 
Brown and Massey together bought KFC for $2 million. Closer to $20 million in today's money, but that still sounds like an absolute pittance, right? Because KFC today is valued at over $5 billion. It was John Brown, not Colonel Sanders, who gave all KFC restaurants their characteristic white and red look. It was Brown who made the Colonel himself the mascot, and it was Brown who grew it from a successful chain of hundreds to a global empire of thousands of stores. Just six years after he bought KFC for $2 million, well, less than $2 million, right? Because Jack Massey also threw in uh, capital. So six years later, Brown sold whatever his stake in KFC was for $285 million dollars. Nice work if you can get it. There's really no interpretation of KFC's story that would portray it as anything other than a nonstop runaway success. It is the second largest restaurant chain in the world after McDonald's. In the U.S., KFC is not quite as dominant, but it's still huge. There have been problems. New corporate owners cut costs to the point where Colonel Sanders himself, shortly before he died, denounced the company for letting food quality slip. As one of the the world's largest retailers of chicken, KFC's animal welfare record is pretty dismal. I mean, look, I eat chicken. I have no problem with killing and eating chickens, but the mainstream broiler fryer industry is legit a horror show. Ultimately, it's the chicken suppliers that are most responsible. Your Cargills, your Tysons, etc. But KFC is the consumer-facing link in the supply chain, and so they naturally come in for more controversy, as well they should. They are profiting handsomely off of those overcrowded chicken houses. I do wonder why KFC seems to come in for more criticism than other chicken chains that are almost as big, or in some cases, bigger. Like, Chick-fil-A now sells way more chicken in the U.S. than KFC does. Is it because KFC chicken is, like, whole pieces? You know, like, McDonald's chicken is pulverized meat emulsion molded into cartoonish shapes and then breaded and fried. The end product resembles a chicken about as much as I do. KFC, in contrast, mostly sells whole chicken pieces, whole legs, whole thighs, etc., all of which look like identifiable parts of the chicken from whence they came. Might that explain why KFC seems to get extra criticism for its animal welfare record? I mean, I think they deserve it regardless, so I don't care that much. It's just an interesting thing to think about. And, of course, there was the fat issue. As we've discussed many times, the American sugar industry in the 1950s paid off scientists at Harvard to produce research that blamed rising rates of heart disease on fat instead of carbs. And the anti-fat furor of the late 20th century was thus ignited. This isn't tinfoil hat conspiracy theory. This is, it's in the, it's in the medical journals. Look it up. Everyone's doctor told them to avoid fried foods as much as possible, which by the way, might still be pretty good advice because too much dietary fat is absolutely very bad for you. It's just not the only thing that's very bad for you. These were unfortunate developments for a restaurant chain called Kentucky Fried Chicken. They tried rebranding as KFC. There's nothing like an initialism to hide who you really are. U.S. sales did slump a bit in the 1980s. It's highly debatable as to why. It may have been fat phobia. It may have been the constant parade of new corporate owners with little experience in the restaurant business. John Brown sold the company to a liquor distributor, which then sold it to R.J. Reynolds, the tobacco company. Cigarettes and fried chicken. That's a hell of a business model. Assuming you can still sleep at night. I don't know how any of them did. Anyway, our old buddy John Young Brown Jr. smelled blood in the water. 
He had sold off his stake in KFC years ago, and he parlayed his success into a political career, just like his dad. He was governor of Kentucky for one term in the early 80s. Of course, Kentucky elected the KFC guy governor. <clears throat> but he was no longer with KFC. And by the late 80s, Brown perceived KFC's weakness. He saw an opening in the U.S. market for chicken that isn't fried. Healthy chicken. Quote, unquote, healthy chicken. The dietary health establishment was pushing chicken as the healthy meat choice in the 80s. Because if you take the skin off, chicken has very little fat. Like us humans, chickens keep most of their fat right under their skin. Subcutaneous fat storage. KFC original recipe is skin on, breaded, and fried in oil. Alternatively, you can roast a chicken in dry heat instead of dropping it in hot oil. And as you roast it, lots of the subcutaneous fat renders and drips away from the bird. All Brown needed was a gimmick, a hook for his healthy fast food chicken, and he found one in The Gambler. Kenny Rogers is a lifelong chow hound. He already had one cookbook out. So John Brown Jr. and Kenny Rogers launched Kenny Rogers Roasters in Coral Springs, Florida in 1991. Hundreds of locations spun out from there, including one that set up shop in the former Mr. Donut location on North Atherton Street in State College, Pennsylvania. Kenny Rogers Roasters was between my dad's office downtown and where we lived, out in the woods near Port Matilda. So it became the meal that my folks picked up when they were too tired or too stressed out to cook. It's healthy, they no doubt said to themselves. Kenny Rogers Roasters made a big selling point of the fact that they cooked their chickens in a rotisserie, that is a spinning spit roaster, which they said allowed the fat to drip harmlessly away from the chicken where it could be sequestered and disposed of safely. I have no idea if that's actually true. Like, I can't think of any reason why spinning a chicken while it cooks would cause more fat to render out. Because it like roast a chicken in your normal oven, like on a sheet pan, and it will, you will see like a lake of fat flood the sheet pan as the chicken cooks. In either case, that fat is no longer in the bird. I can find no research testing various roasting methods for amount of fat rendered. Rotisseries are definitely good because they continually baste the chicken in its own drippings, which makes for like really tasty skin. But what really made the skin tasty at Kenny Rogers Roasters was the marinade or the flavored brine or the sauce or whatever the hell it is that they use. They definitely brined those chickens somehow or they injected them with brine or fat or something because they were extremely juicy chickens while still being cooked to smithereens. A Kenny Rogers chicken just kind of fell apart in your hands. The only way to get chicken that soft is to cook the living hell out of it, which dries the white meat, but you can compensate by brining the bird or injecting it with stuff. The salt breaks down meat proteins, which form a gel with the surrounding water, and this gel retains water during cooking. If you brine a chicken and cook it normally, it's too juicy, in my opinion. And too firm. It tastes like those like water-added lunch meat products. But I've been coming around to poultry brines lately because I realized what I believe to be the secret. You have to overcook the chicken if you brine it. And those Kenny Rogers chickens were definitely overcooked. Consumers like soft meat. They don't like to work too hard. And they're kind of grossed out by tearing meat off of bones, so it makes sense to cook the chicken until the meat just falls off the bone, you know, barbecue style. 
This is also probably microbiologically safer, which is a big plus for a giant chain where quality control is difficult and you have no idea if the underpaid teenagers you've hired are going to cook the chicken to the right temperature. If you massively overcook the chicken as a matter of practice, that's a terrific insurance policy as far as food safety is concerned. And you can get away with it if you brine the crap out of the chicken or if you have some kind of sauce or marinade. I remember the Kenny Rogers chicken is having a flavor that I couldn't quite place. It tasted exotic in a way that seemed at odds with the kind of down-home Texas marketing they did with Kenny himself. The secret seems to have been citrus juice. Like most copycat recipes online are lemon or lime juice plus a little soy sauce and then ketchup or chili sauce or something else red and sweet and lots of herbs and spices and such. I don't think it made it into the video, but when I did a video about like homemade rotisserie chicken where I tied the chickens up and I hung them from the roof of the oven, whenever I was working on that recipe, I did one with like a Kenny Rogers style marinade with lime juice and soy sauce and holy crap, that tasted almost exactly like a Kenny Rogers chicken. Or so I recall. I've not had Kenny Rogers chicken in decades because the location on North Atherton closed along with every other North American location. What went wrong? In the 90s, it seemed as though nothing could stop Kenny Rogers roasters. The basic marketing formula worked. They got themselves written into an episode of Seinfeld, The one where Kenny Rogers opens across the street from Jerry and Kramer's building and the bright sign keeps them awake at night. So they try to like sabotage the restaurant, but then Kramer actually tastes the chicken because like Newman makes him taste it. Kramer tastes the chicken. He gets hooked on the chicken. It was all quite flattering for Kenny Rogers. And apparently it was not a paid product placement. It was just an idea that Jerry and the writers had and Kenny Rogers let them use all the trademarks company spokesperson randy rogers told the south florida sun sentinel at the time quote it costs a million dollars a minute to advertise on that show and it didn't cost us a penny so what went wrong well the kenny rogers model turned out to be a little too replicable all you do is buy whole relatively unprocessed chickens which you can buy for a song And then you marinate them and throw them in an oven. In contrast, if you want to imitate KFC chicken, you need that whole like pressure fryer setup. To imitate Kenny Rogers chicken, you just need an oven. In the extremely wealthy western suburbs of Boston, Mitt Romney territory, that's where he lived when he lived out there, A couple of guys out there started a restaurant called Boston Chicken that eventually became Boston Market. And Boston Market was virtually a carbon copy of Kenny Rogers Roasters. The chicken didn't have the same citrusy zing, as I recall, but it was juicy and salty and fell apart in your hands. And the sides were good. But Boston Market went into bankruptcy, too. A new player arose in the rotisserie chicken market, one that neither Boston Market nor Kenny Rogers could hope to defeat, and this new player in the market was the market itself. Grocery stores, supermarkets, grocery chains found that they could repurpose old, unsold, raw, whole chickens by roasting them in the back and then selling them in little bags from hot tables up front. They generally lost money on the birds, but they lost less than if they threw out the excess inventory. And rotisserie chickens became an excellent loss leader for grocery stores. Yeah, you lose money on them, but they bring people in the door. When I was a little kid, my mom generally went to the supermarket once a week to do all our shopping for that week. That was the American way of grocery shopping. But rotisserie chickens brought in a totally different kind of customer. My dad running into the store for five minutes on the way home from work just to get a couple of things for dinner that night. 
Boston Market and Kenny Rogers Roasters both declared bankruptcy in 1998. Boston Market got bought up by McDonald's. Kenny Rogers got bought by Nathan's Famous, the hot dog company, for just over a million dollars. How humiliating is that? All of the North American Kenny Rogers locations gradually closed. There are none left. You can still recognize the old Kenny Rogers slash Mr. Donut location on North Atherton in State College because it still has that characteristic triangular Kenny Rogers pediment on top of the building. Kenny loved triangles, I guess. Now there's a Korean place in there. Kimchi Korean Restaurant. And that's probably for the best. I bet you that place is way better than either Mr. Donut or Kenny Rogers Roasters. It's ironic that East Asia sent its food to North Atherton Street, while at the same time, North Atherton Street sent its food to East Asia. We switched. Just like Mr. Donut, Kenny Rogers Roasters also became a massive hit in the East. The company is now based in Malaysia, independent from Nathan's. Kenny's Chicken is in China, the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, India now. And they're going for the Middle East next. Kenny's Chicken is in Dubai. They seem to have adjusted recipes a bit for local tastes. Lots of chili sauce, for example. But the OG recipe was kind of Southeast Asian flavored already. That combination of lime juice and soy sauce. So yeah, that chicken is a hit in the East. I'm glad Kenny lived long enough to see it. He died in 2020, looking almost exactly the same as he had for the last 60 years. We can't rely on each other. Uh -uh. I love how Dolly calls him Kenny. Just like in South Park. Oh, Kenny. Dolly and Kenny forever. Asia. I hope you're happy with the trade. You got Mr. Donut and Kenny Rogers. We got Kimchi Korean Restaurant. I feel good about the trade. And I feel good about this episode of the Adam Ragusea podcast. As good as I ever feel about things I make. Make good choices. I'll talk to you next time. I'll pew.